good evening. Welcome everybody to this spring IBMS event. Um, it's lovely to have you all along on what is certainly a pleasant evening where I am. Um, we hope you enjoy this session. I have two speakers from the IBMS um, here, Deborah Paget and David Wells. Um, Deborah's going to do some discussion of her career pathway. And David is going to talk about point of care testing. So it couldn't be more different and completely different subjects to what we've had on these previous events. So I would like to welcome Deborah to uh, take the stage and I will turn my microphone off as she will be doing the speaking. Thank you ever so much, Sue, and thank you everybody for joining this evening. Um, it's really bizarre when you're talking to a screen where you can't see everybody looking back at you, but I'm sure you're all there, so um, it's really nice to join you in London this evening from sunny, yeah, still sunny, Cumbria this, this evening. Um, my, my presentation, I, I can talk a little bit about my career history today, and I will as part of my introduction, um, but I'm actually going to speak about the strategy um, for the Institute um, that we launched at Congress earlier this year, and we'll form our work plan for, for the next five years going forward. Um, I'll share my screen and we'll just make sure if, uh, if David or Sue can just confirm that you can definitely see it. That is definitely visible, thank you. Good, good, that's brilliant, thank you ever so much. Um, so I'll, I will tell you a little bit about my career history and then, then we'll move on to the strategy. So um, I have been an HCPC registered biomedical scientist for <clears throat> just over 20 years. Um, and I've been a member of the Institute for my whole career. Um, having graduated with a degree in physiology, that was my undergrad degree, I had to go through the process of top-ups um, and I joined um, my first laboratory in North Cumbria as a medical laboratory assistant to get some um, laboratory experience all those years ago, not really knowing where my career was going to develop to. I was really lucky that a trainee post became available reasonably quickly um, into that uh, start of my career. And I had a fantastic um, set of senior managers with me in North Cumbria um, who helped foster my education um, and those early days as a trainee biomedical scientist. So I did my top ups. I did, and which again shows my age, the blue book. I think I was actually the last year of the blue book. And I'll look at David for that because I know we're the same age. Um, so I think we were about the last year of the blue book for HCPC registration. Um, yeah, he's nodding. Good, good. <laughs> uh, we, we've done lots of uh, um, different career paths, but find ourselves in similar roles now, which is, which is quite impressive. Um, I then went on and did my uh, master's in medical microbiology uh, at the University of the West of England in Bristol um, and uh, really solidified my career as a biomedical scientist in microbiology in North Cumbria. Um, and I suppose at the time I kind of felt like I'd got stuck at that point. Um, I was about six. Um, I was honing my skills in the lab, but actually I was gathering an awful lot of qualifications and further education. And now I tell the students that I um, are heavily involved with um, and as part of events like this, um, please don't get frustrated by that. That is the time when you are really becoming an expert in your field. It may feel like you're gathering lots of qualifications and not using them, but you are building your toolkit of skills that you will use to develop your career as you progress through the bands. Um, I then applied and was successful and went into a role as pathology quality manager. Um, and that was a fantastic opportunity at a time when we were transitioning from CPA to the ISO standards. It's also the time that I joined council. As I say, I'd been um, region and branch treasurer and chair and uh, secretary all the way through my career, but moving to council was a fantastic opportunity. And at a time where we were really starting to shape the quality agenda for our profession um, and being involved in that and taking the ISO 15189 roadshows around the country was a fantastic experience. 
I was really lucky and five years later I had the opportunity to apply for the post as operational manager back in the lab that I'd grown up in as an MLA all those years previously. So when I say I have been at every band on the career structure, I really do mean that from band two um, to my current role as clinical pathology lead in Northumbria. Um, so having grown up in uh, the northeast, it's really nice to be back over there now, although I still live in Cumbria. Um, I've been on council now for 10 years. Um, I've been chair of the membership and marketing committee, um, working alongside David as council member and with all of the other team that help really shape the profession and how we deliver what we do for the wider membership. I am absolutely passionate about what I do. Um, I credit the Institute with making me the biomedical scientist that I am today. And now I have the huge honor of being able to represent our amazing profession um, with the same passion and commitment I had all of those years ago when I was fresh faced MLA into the role um, as your president. Um, and that is a huge, huge honor. So it's lovely to be here this evening. That's a whistle stop tour of how I've gone from a band two to, to president. Um, and I hope I'll do you proud. I will absolutely work my socks off. Um, and I think David and I make quite a formidable team um, driving this profession forward as well. So um, in really excited to, to see you this evening and to hear what you have to say. So I'll move on um, and we'll head into the strategy, um, which to be fair, David has often presented on. Um, and it's what we launched uh, as part of Congress, as I say earlier on today. Um, really, we just have to take a moment and understand our history. We have been here for over a hundred years and we are still as dedicated as we were then to supporting, progressing and promoting excellence in biomedical science and all aspects of healthcare that we touch as part of that patient pathway and service to the public. Um, it's been fantastic working with um, council and the members of the exec team within Corbath Square working to deliver the, re the revised strategy 2022. Um, but again, it all hangs around those three pillars of our member value proposition, support, progress and promote. And that underpins everything that I believe in as a council member and engaging you as the membership. It's been a huge piece of work. Um, although you will still see some similarities from the previous strategy, but our mission really is to do what we've been doing and now do it better and build on those foundations and make it a better organisation for the membership as a whole. So if we just focus on um, our values, which is still core to everything that we do, um, our member focus um, is really about making sure that we spend the time and it's, as I say, doing events like this this evening and being out on the road now that we can, after a two year hiatus of not being able to see anyone, um, is fantastic and an opportunity to really listen to our members and address the issues, the problems, the concerns that are important to you in the role that you deliver every day. And what we want to do is tailor that um, to the high quality and value of care that we provide for our patients. Um, my role as president has changed. Um, it's certainly different from um, those that have gone before me and the way that I need to advocate for you. Um, we are much more vocal as a profession now and we need to maintain that focus. Um, and I also think that we need to take some time and really celebrate our successes but also make sure that we're telling you as the membership what we are doing from Colbath Square on a daily basis. Because I think previously we've been very good at doing that, but not ensuring that you are fully aware and informed of that. So we are committed to making sure that's done better as we progress. Integrity. I think this is core to all of us as, as professionals and, and what we do every day. We will always act with honesty and integrity. Um, and Jill, previous C, uh, CEO, always used to say, we'll do what we say. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll um, say what we do and do what we say. Um, and never, I think, has that been more appropriate that we are open and honest and transparent in what we do and also in the governance um, that really drives what we do as a profession. 
but we also need to challenge that um, and we need to get a little bit more brave in what we're trying to achieve and how we put ourselves out there to do that. Professionalism, that just goes without saying really. We have to be very proud of what we do and very positive about the key um, parts of our engagement. We have been here since 1912. We know we're doing it right. Um, and we have to really make no apology for standing up for the things that we believe in um, and what makes us uh, proud to be biomedical scientists. Respect. Um, I don't think we've ever been more diverse as a workforce and as our council as we are today. Um, it's really heartening to see around the council table um, how that leadership um, and advocacy has changed, certainly in the 10 years that I've sat around council uh, when we were a much more male dominated profession and that's now not the case in any way, shape or form. Um, obviously being third lady president is uh, fantastic from my point of view, but I think it represents how we're developing as a profession. We still need to go further. We have more work to do around our um, equality, diversity and inclusion side of things. But we will say, and David, excuse me for blatantly pinching this from um, Congress earlier, we make no apology that EDI is not part of our strategy. It should absolutely be inherent to everything that we do every day as an institute. So it's not in here as a separate work stream it, because it is part of everything that we deliver every day. We are really developing the EDI though, and I'll just take a second to talk about it. I'm sure that you've seen on social media at the moment that um, council led by Tamina Hussein is launching the new work stream around the equality, diversity and inclusion um, aspect of um, developing the Institute's um, equality, diversion, diversity and inclusion um, pathway um, and if anybody is interested in becoming involved or joining that please do get in touch because we want to make sure that we have as diverse a representation as we possibly can. Continuous improvement well as an ex-quality manager it would be somewhat remiss of me to not just talk about continuous improvement for a little second. Um, there's lots of different strands to this. We do need to make sure that we are learning from our mistakes. Um, we will get things wrong as we progress. We'll get things wrong in this strategy, but that's about the statement I made earlier about being braver. Um, and part of being brave is accepting when things don't go so well, um, but we all know that's how we develop, that's how we improve. Um, and so um, it's just important that we learn from those mistakes along the way. We will work more collaboratively as well. To be fair, we always have. But again, I don't think our links with RCPATH and ACB have ever been stronger than they are at the moment. Um, but it is important that we remember our own identity. There will be times where we will publish as a triumvirate and there will be times that we will stand independently from those other groups. Um, but it's about learning where that collaborative piece sits most, most comfortably for us. Um, and so, as I said at the beginning, our member value proposition won't change. Those three pillars remain core to everything that we deliver on a daily basis. So, um, as we move into part one of the strategy, and again, David, I'm going to pinch your term because I just, I love this phrase. Um, so, part one is building upon our experience and expertise, or to coin David, business as usual, but better. Um, so this is what we, this is the bread and butter of the Institute, this is what we do best, but we have to make sure that we are stretching it and we are developing it to ensure it's still fit for the future and fit for the profession as a whole. <clears throat> so the first strand is under the support heading, and this really is around better access to our HCPC registration. There are a multitude of different pathways um, to bring people into uh, our profession and into registration to be able to practice as biomedical scientists. Um, but we do have to make sure that we're agile and that we're finding the best fit for all those possible routes for any individual on any day. Um, again, we make no apology for the standards of entry. 
they aren't negotiable. Um, we are a degree entry profession and we won't change that, but we can look differently at how we apply them to ensure that that fitness for the future um, is ongoing um, and that everybody has an equal opportunity to reach HCPC registration. To do that, we need to work closer with our partners within Health Education England and the devolved administrations um, to make sure that we've got appropriate funding in place, that we've got the opportunity for work-based practice um, and time where people can really understand what the laboratories are like so that they understand what coming into the profession really involves. Progress. Um, so, we often um, concentrate on our new registrants and bringing people in, but we have to appreciate um, that our existing members just need the same level of nurturing support and development to progress their careers and to get them where they need to be. Um, I kind of liken this one to car insurance. Um, we don't want to become the car insurer um, that only supports the new customer and we have to be seen to be doing as much if not more for the loyal people that stay with us um, so that development opportunity is absolutely key as we progress here as a profession we never stand still um, and it's really important that we move to support our members in their daily practice and then support them through their career. Um, so whether that's vocational to the role that they are currently in or how we develop them to become leaders of the future. Um, we need to recognize and progress those existing members. And again, this must be agile. People learn differently now, we appreciate that. So doing whole scale qualifications aren't necessarily the right fit for everyone. They may still be, but not for everyone. And so we'll look at how we modular, I always struggle with this one, modularize our learning material so that we have a more flexible approach to how people can approach their learning, take it in bite-sized chunks, build on it and develop their um, portfolio as they want to. Um, so that if someone doesn't want to do a specialist portfolio in chemistry because it's not fitting for the vocation um, or for the job role that they do on a day-to-day -day basis, they'll be able to pick and choose parts of chemistry with parts of haematology, maybe a module of transfusion or immunology because that's more reflective of the job that they do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so that's how we'll develop as we progress over, over the coming months and years. And then the last one is promote. Um, and there's been a lot of talk of advanced practice. And this is really the key strand of strategy where we'll talk about um, how we really establish that full curricula across all of the disciplines. Um, again, David and I spend a lot of time talking about the fact that as HCPC registered by medical scientists, we aren't constrained by anything other than that HCPC registration and our ability to evidence competence within our scope of practice. There is no glass ceiling. We can break through that and we can become equivalent in so many different ways and paths. Um, and now what we need to do is ensure that we have the framework of qualifications around that advanced practice to be able to help and support you achieve it. I think it's fair to say it's been quite difficult to move the agenda on advanced practice. Um, it, it, you know, it's it stalled over the course of the pandemic, um, but we are now back on track. We've never had more support than we have now from the RC path with regard to not only cellular pathology, um, but also widening our advanced practice into both microbiology and hematology, because we understand the workforce pressures that there are out there around our consultant um, colleagues within the medical sphere. Um, I think it's really important that we note that the, the point of the advanced practice piece is to enable us to work collaboratively um, with those medical colleagues and provide a holistic way of delivering, um, especially in cellular pathology, reporting and dissection, um, so that it is a team work piece um, to ensure that we are dealing with the backlog, but we're developing our workforce um, as much as we possibly can. Um, 
we need to embrace and support these higher qualifications. We're working really hard behind the scenes, as I say, um, and please do keep an eye out. Again, we are looking at how we can develop um, a more modular way of approaching advanced practice. Um, but we are also very much aware that there are already pockets of this going on around the country. Um, and we will be reaching out to a certain extent to, to hear how you are performing those roles within your areas um, and learning from that best, best practice that is already in place so that we can support that framework of delivery for others as they also progress. Then we get to part two. Um, so this is where we really start to have a little bit of ambition and stretch what we are capable of as a profession. This is way more proactive about how we are um, going to perform as an institute on behalf of our members. So again, it's hung around the three pillars and we start with promote. Um, I think it's safe to say um, that for the first time in a long time, um, people are starting to understand what a biomedical scientist is. Our profile has never been higher than it is currently. I don't think I'd have ever saw the day where people were talking about laboratory testing on buses and trains and in the pub and whilst watching football. Um, and it's really, really heartening to see that. But we can't let this slide now. We have to build on what we've already achieved. I think it's also important to note that we have the ear of the media. We have quite a few um, contacts within media circles and they regularly contact us. Um, obviously, the last couple of days we've been heavily involved with monkeypox and again we've had media requests to understand more about um, the approach from um, the testing side of things. We also have the ear of ministers and government. Um, and really what we want to do as part of this piece of the work is establish a policy unit who will help to provide the advice and guidance to really promote the work of the Institute and all of our members. And doing that, again, not only in isolation, but where appropriate, doing that in collaboration with other professional bodies um, to promote those common areas of interest. Um, but really, it's important that we continue to build those strong links that we have within government, within the media, um, and wider than that as well. Um, the future role of the Institute has changed, but we do have to leverage our media profile to ensure that we do become that first point of contact um, for media and public queries. And our policy unit is really our guiding light on how we will do that as we progress leads us beautifully on to progress. Um, so this is about our scope and range, um, both within the UK and wider. Um, we have a core membership and um, our membership will always be held dear to what we do and we will never compromise that existing membership as part of how we develop. But we have a lot to learn from what goes on in other sectors and across the world as well. We have to be able to really grow those links that we've um, built up with our industry and academic colleagues. Again, learning from that time over the pandemic, um, those links have really strengthened and now we need to foster those to make sure we are developing as much. We know our workforce move more between academia, um, diagnostic laboratories, industry. Um, and so we need to be able to support that to ensure that we have um, all the right links and the right conversations where we need them. But then we also need to reach a little wider um, and look outside of the UK. We are an international organization. We have regions and branches around the world. Um, they are developing as we speak. Um, I'm sure David can tell you a little bit about um, our new regions and branches um, that I think he and I are fighting over who's going to get on the plane and, and go and visit them first. Um, but they have different ways of working and there's a lot to be said for that. Um, and obviously David's going to go on to talk about point of care. Um, and some of, some of these areas are much better at this than we are, both within industry across the world. And we have to learn and develop our offering accordingly. And then finally, support. Um, so whilst we have 
raised our profile. Um, and whilst laboratory testing is, is in conversation, I would still ask you, um, if you say to your parents or your grandparents or your children or your aunts and uncles tonight at the end of this, what they think you do for a living, what do you think they're going to tell you? And I still don't think we're quite there with this. So not only do we need to ensure that we can articulate our role within the patient pathway ourselves, historically we're not very good at doing that, um, we don't shout about what we do, um, and we, we just do it um, because that's what, how we've been brought up. But we need to understand what the impact of our profession is, both locally and then more widely. So to help with that and to be able to articulate it with um, our ministerial colleagues and our media colleagues, um, having some peer-reviewed evidence to help support that would be would be hugely beneficial. There are lots of papers out there and peer reviewed evidence around um, what a nurse practitioner can bring to the patient pathway. But when you do the same search for a biomedical scientist, you will find very, very few papers. Um, indeed, I saw something on Twitter the other day um, where one of our colleagues um, had done something similar and it was shockingly low, low the number of papers. So what we want to be able to do is commission that academic research so that we can peer review and peer evidence the benefit that we bring to healthcare and science. And we want to put some funding into PhD studies um, to help with that. Again, doing that on our own will be appropriate in some cases, but also linking in um, to our other professional body colleagues will also be very, very useful. So that's the strategy and that's where we're at now. Two clear halves, um, business as usual, but better, and then stretching and ambition and development. Um, and we really look forward to working with you on delivering it and understanding what your challenges are and why, um, what, why and how we can help you develop along the way. I think it's important to just close by saying I have never been as proud of the profession and, as, and to be a biomedical scientist as I am today. It's a huge honour to serve as your president. Um, and we really need to take a moment just to recall the achievements that we've made over the last two years, but also since 1912. David and I have been working on a piece today for the, the Jubilee, and we were asked to look back at the, the three key changes that we faced over the reign of Queen Elizabeth. Um, and actually, when you take the time to review, we are an amazing profession. We have developed so much in our time. Um, and the world is our oyster, so let's make the most of it. I think the other thing it would be remiss of me not to, to mention before we finish, I am well aware of the incredible, incredible commitment that our Institute members have made and the sacrifices that they've made um, across the last two years for the pandemic. And I know a lot of people have lost people close to them along the way, which is so terribly sad. But I do think we just need to take a moment to recognise all that you have achieved, but also on behalf of the Institute, to thank you all for the time, commitment um, and professionalism that you have delivered as part of the pandemic response. So a huge thank you. It's been fantastic joining you this evening. I'll happily take any questions um, and thank you ever so much. Thank you, Deborah. That was, uh, by turns, inspirational, rousing and touching. And I hope it uh, really provides a lot of food for thought for people earlier on in their careers on just where you can go, what you can achieve and some really, really nice strategic aims of the Institute there as well. Um, so I can see thank yous coming up. Um, no particular questions. So in the interest of sticking to time for people. Um, I'd now like David, if he would pick up after that to follow on uh, and discuss the point of care testing. Once again, thank you so much, Deborah. Uh, your commitment is quite profound and thank you very much. Thank you. 
Thank you, Deborah, and uh, thank you, Sue. And uh, I, I'm I'm always always pleased to be back in my old stomping ground of London, of course. So um, this is where I where I cut my teeth, as it were, as as um as we were reminiscing about our past and what we've done in the future, in, in our in our careers. And I think really just to add to what Deborah says, I, I um it's the first opportunity I've had probably to talk to a lot of you who have worked uh, tirelessly over the past uh, few months and years. Um, it has been a momentous time for us um, as, as biomedical scientists and uh, you have done us all proud and the country proud and, and I think you should uh, take that away. If not, nothing else, we won't get thanks from, from most people because they won't recognise us, but please, uh, please have in your hearts that, um, that uh, I know that you deserve every ounce of thanks from, from a very grateful nation. So following on really from Deborah's uh, piece around our, our future strategy, I want to talk a little bit about um, point of care and the role of, that we will have in the future as we roll out new ways of working. And this is a piece of work that actually is to a degree, uh, and, I, and to a degree I want your feedback on, because the world of point of care is changing dramatically. I think the uh, COVID pandemic really shone, shone a light upon the fact that the world is very different and actually the capability of the general population in doing testing has changed a lot. So I'm going to sort of talk a little bit about what that looks like and what that means, if my computer works, that is. Of course, I've got everything all right. So, as I said, uh, point of care is increasingly being used in a, a range of settings, and actually, throughout the pandemic, we've seen that really increase, and, and people have been using point of care in a very different way to, to manage patient pathways and to manage patients in a, in a way that we haven't done before, because, and certainly not at the scale we did, but also realising that they would have seen the benefit of that means that our world really is changing quite dramatically. Now, if I go back a, a few years, this is how diagnostic traditionally was managed. Um, and it's a very full um, uh, slide, which I do apologise for partly, but actually this gives an idea of the complexity of the world we work in. Now, hopefully you can see, see my, my mouse as I move it around the screen. This is this area here, the asymptomatic line and a patient diagnostic pathway is really what happens in a diagnostic pathway traditionally. And we don't really start looking at pathology data until we get to the interpretation point, which is well down the pathway of any, any patient care visit point to point, point. And that world is the bit that's changing. And we should accept that to be changing because we do need to be involved far more early on in the patient pathway. If we want to, as a nation to be in a situation where we are leading the world on our cancer outcomes, as opposed to following the, the pack quite, quite, uh, uh, quite poorly in terms of our cancer outcomes, we definitely need to move the needle on where we're uh, dealing with and where diagnostics fits in and it's definitely got to be in the observation area if not right up here at the point where we're first seeing symptoms and point of care of course can really really add to that a bit uh, that capability uh, if we want to do better in that regard so what's my vision for the future and in fact i say what's my vision for the future no one's said to me this is wrong so far but i'm going to make, make it clear that this is what our vision should be and so the, the, area, the yellow area, which is about big data, it's about using our data and information better, asks us to look far earlier on in that patient pathway. So we're spending a lot, lot more time in this proactive ob observation of symptoms and asymptomatic populations to determine who should be going to different pathways and how they might be managed. And if you look at the bottom of the, uh, the, the chart here, you'll see that actually what we're also talking about is not just traditional point of care device. And I think this is the bit that I think we need to uh, um, improve and mature our, our, um, our view of point of care, is we're starting to talk about not just devices that test diagnostic tests in, in a traditional way, like blood gases or glucometers or, or clotting, et cetera, but start looking at risk factors. And these could be urinalysis, uh, they could well be indwelled um, sensors, so for continuous monitoring for glucose, but it also could be uh, things such as your behavior how fast you're walking, how often you check your mobile phone, whether you are behaving or in a, in a way that you're traditionally behaving for a whole range of reasons that might actually suggest to us uh, uh, we might need to start taking a more proactive look at your diagnostics. Uh, and I'll come on to perhaps some of those later on, but the, the key thing here is that in the UK we see some life-limiting disease, particularly around cancer, presenting in A&E. And that's often too late. It's, that's often catastrophic for the patient. It's catastrophic for their, their families. It's catastrophic for the healthcare system because it then has to deal with an acute um, presentation of a patient who requires complex care and onward um, uh, patient management and treatment, et cetera, when we could have prevented it. 
if we just use diagnostics better. And this is not, uh, as I said before, it's not necessarily about new diagnostics, it's, it's potentially about diagnostics we already have to our hand already, but we're not currently using them in the settings that we might need to in the future. But as I said, it's being increasingly, body care is being increasingly used in a range of settings. Now, these settings are increasingly not uh, traditionally areas where we have worked. So they're often outside our laboratories, outside our, our um, area of, of influence. Now, that, that might be just as far as A&E, and that may well be outside our area of influence, but more commonly now, we're starting to see the, uh, the community diagnostic centres, we're starting to see primary care looking and interested in, in managing um, uh, um, body care, but we're also seeing, thanks to COVID, people taking tests at home, going to the pharmacy, buying uh, a diagnostic test or, or online, and undertaking those tests, and then managing their own healthcare according to the results of those. And also we're seeing with the various uh, advances in, in um, incident management um, in, for diabetes in dwelling centres that actually require people to interact with technology, with data, etc., to monitor it. So when we're talking about point of care in the future, we are talking about these new settings. And, and some of them are old settings, but the definition I think is new. So there's the, the self-testing, which is the, the long-term monitoring of patients. And these patients may well be expert patients or be trained to manage their diagnostic tests in a way that supports their, their own management of their, of their condition. There are home testing, and again, we've used home testing uh, quite prevalently over the last year, but in fact, we've been using it for a lot longer than that. So pregnancy testing, sexual health testing, et cetera. And these could well be ways of people accessing healthcare sooner. And there could be tests that they could be purchasing uh, on, on the high street or online, as I said. And we need to think about how we might support those people and support the general population uh, in, in terms of, of under, undertaking those tests. Next item really is the clinical setting, and this could be any clinical setting, CDCs, GPs, outpatients, etc., where we don't traditionally work. And I think Deborah was talking earlier on about how biomedical scientists can be working in new and interesting arenas. The CDCs, GPs, outpatients, etc., is a prime example of where we could be having a, a, a footprint of biomedical scientists working and delivering services from uh, in, in our future. And I'm not thinking about a, a special breed of biomedical scientists. Quite often the skills we're talking about don't already exist within our workforce. We just don't work in those environments yet, and, and perhaps we should, because we will support the better use of technology, the better use of, of diagnostics. And in fact, actually, when we start talking about advanced roles, it gives us an opportunity to start managing clinics. So I'm thinking here about those who are running hematology clinics around the country, or potentially in diabetology, et cetera, where we could be having an impact, and we may not necessarily currently be doing so. And then there's a the slightly more traditional area, but still an area where we may struggle to get um, uh, our, our influence felt is in the hospital setting, so emergency departments, ITUs, acute care, etc. So you can see that point of care is, is starting to merge into what I would consider these four different buckets that makes a big difference in the way we need to manage them and, and how we support their delivery. Some of them are very patient facing, some of them are clinician facing, and some of them are very much in the traditional world that we've been working for a long time. So one of the things we've got to remember, and we are the people who hold this uh, responsibility, is that actually our tests, the tests that we provide, the tests that people use, the tests that are available on the high street, uh, we need to make sure they're being used in a way that is safe. Uh, the, the quality standards that you would expect to see in your laboratory are maintained in their usage. Now, that doesn't mean they have to perform as well as uh, the tests in the laboratory, but what it does mean is it means that the, the, the uh, downstream pathway is uh, accounts for any uh, vagaries in the test, or any, any lack of sensitivity in the test, or supports patients. So we don't miss anyone where we should not miss people. And this is where it becomes really important. We saw during the pandemic the use of uh, lateral flow devices. Now, in terms of their sensitivity and specificity, we know they're pretty poor, but on a global usage point of view, as a, as a public health tool, they became very, very useful for us to understand how people might moderate, moderate their behavior accordingly to reduce the, the, the public health risk of them passing it on. And so we learned that. We learned that actually the, the use, the case of, of technology became really important. And we saw a definite scale from those tests being used at home, uh, lateral flow tests, those tests that are being used in the emergency departments, and these are the um, tests which may well be uh, lamp-like technology where the result could be available very quickly, but its sensitive specificity was not necessarily as good as the laboratory, but it was much better than lateral flow tests and because of the speed in which it was deployed, it was more useful 
uh, than a PCR test that could follow up the test later on. Um, we also need to make sure that when we're doing that, and, and, I, and I, uh, again using the, the pandemic as a prime example, is that we are supporting, we are the experts here, that we're, we're giving people clear guidance and flags about what tests to use where. And again, when we were talking about the pandemic, when we we're looking at rapid testing in, in EDs, uh, we spent a lot of time working out what was the optimum piece of equipment, what was the right technology, who were the right suppliers to help clinicians navigate that very complex uh, COVID light areas and, and the COVID positive areas in, in hospitals that prevented outbreaks, that prevented hospital acquired cases of COVID that actually meant that we could manage and, and suppress the pandemic from, from the NHS point of view. So again, we have got to be one, and we have got to work out how we deliver that, uh, that level of advice. Is it through guidance from organisations such as the Institute of Biological Science, or is it guidance through uh, national bodies such as NHS England or, uh, or the MHRA, et cetera? So again, we, we need to make sure we're feeding into those areas and we're providing our expertise. And, and as Deborah said, we're doing a lot more now with the Institute to make sure that we're having our voice clearly heard in those conversations. And, and I come to place wrong because this, this is an example of that. Um, we also need to remember, and again, um, I go back to the point that uh, it, if you'd asked me the question uh, back in 2019, could we see more home-based testing uh, in, in, the, in the community? And could we be asking people to undertake swabbing for things such as PCR testing? I would have probably said no. I would have probably said no, I don't think that's something the public would be able to do. It's not something the public would be willing to do. And in fact, actually, I think it, the public would be getting it wrong. Now, I stand utterly uh, corrected and if anything my view was in incredibly patronising and I, and I regret uh, holding that view now fully because actually what we were shown was actually people do uh, have an interest in testing at home, people can be and are capable of, of uh, undertaking tests and in fact actually interestingly self-swabbing is more successful than swabbing by a clinician or, or a healthcare um, a worker uh, because people have a best interest in getting their diagnostic tests right and so what we need to do is make sure we're providing the right information in a simplistic way to ensure that it is accessible for as many people as possible but with the right information included so people can successfully undertake any testing that we do those people with long-term conditions, that's far easier because actually you can bring them in, you can have the conversation, you can send them home with the kit uh, with the instruction how to use it. With some of the home testing, again, I'm, I'm talking about here for the diagnostics of sexual health, pregnancy, COVID, et cetera, you might need to think about online videos where people might be able to access it as they need it, as opposed to uh, bespoke training, which might be delivered through those who are managing long-term conditions. And that gives us a whole new area of the workforce. Um, who are the people who are undertaking the training? Uh, it's an interesting job to be done to, to, to do and actually a very, very uh, skilled uh, role to ensure people's information is passed on appropriately and carefully. How do we make sure they're undertaking the tests as we want them to? Who's monitoring that? How's that being fed back? Uh, who is uh, selecting the equipment? Uh, who's deploying the equipment? How are we undertaking the quality assurance and the governance, et cetera? These become really, really important points um, that actually us as biomedical scientists could be getting involved in in a way that we've not done before and wouldn't it be great if we have people who are going out out in the community going around demonstrating and showing people who are managing long-term conditions how to undertake their own diagnostic tests and manage their conditions better now of course the strength there of course is the better that an individual manages their long-term condition the lower the, the impact uh, their condition has on their health and the lower the impact their condition has on the health system which allows uh, the health system to do more for less and I think that's really important it's an important part of our role uh, delivering healthcare. Now recently uh, NHS England uh, working with the um, uh, pharmacy um, units um, published some guidance on, uh, on, on pharmacy teams using point of care. Now what for, for me isn't clear is what was the level of engagement for biomedical scientists certainly the institute was not involved in that and at the time I was the head of pathology for the, the NHS in England and I certainly wasn't involved in this uh, formation of this of this guidance so you can see that uh, we still have some way to go to make sure involved in all, all points but there's some important points that came out of this guidance and they're obvious ones to us perhaps but actually important to get across and out there into the community that we need to make sure we buy the right kit so just buying the, the kit from the uh, 
uh, from the rep who turns up at your door telling you uh, your hemoglobin A1C tests uh, may not be the right answer. And actually you need to make sure you involve you involved experts in, these, in selecting the equipment. Using it right, and again, this is what we've been talking about and we talk about a lot in our own uh, environment. How do you make sure we've trained people appropriately to do the tests? You know, a badly conducted test is as bad as no test at all uh, in, in, the, in, in, in seeking a, di a, a diagnosis. And then keeping it right, and this means storing it correctly, making sure that you're QAing it, making sure that uh, every time you use the piece of kit, it is in the right uh, format so that actually you can use it correctly. So the recommendations from this report, uh, from this from this guidance, sorry, um, is that actually we need to identify best practice in selection of equipment um, so that you've got high quality cert and results and that it's safe to use, but also it is uh, a lot more cost and we'll perhaps we'll talk about that later on. Um, that there's a management system around it. And again, it's very, very uh, basic to us. We're all working within quality management systems uh, nowadays, but actually making sure that pharmacists undertake that. And again, this is an area that we as biomedical scientists and our pathology services should definitely be getting involved in reaching out to community pharmacists so that we could offer that service to you. Uh, we can help provide you QA, we can help you manage and monitor your equipment to make sure it's being used in the right way. Uh, so we have a role to play there. And then again, establishing a model of good clinical governance. Now, again, this is something we do day in, day out, isn't it? Um, and actually, again, uh, my ambition and my vision would, would certainly be, why aren't they involved in the local laboratory in this? And perhaps in the future they will be. But clearly, people are starting to talk about this in a way that we would understand, and we need to make sure we've got our foot in the door. But this guidance uh, that's come out needs to go much further. So um, we need to make sure the point of care is to be defined and the policy directives support the application within the care setting. So that means we've got to be a lot more nuanced in our advice. So, so I, as I said earlier on about those four buckets, home testing, self-testing, clinical setting, and acute setting, we need to make sure that actually we have advice that is attuned to each of those settings because it's subtly different and it's important that we recognize that. We've also got to set out clear principles to govern the use and the application of point of care. Now, uh, those of you who are, who are old like me will know that Department of Health many years ago issued like a 10 point um, guidance position on the use of point of care. That is yet to be superseded that piece of work of 10 points of how to use or good practice of point of care is yet to be uh, improved upon and given a, 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 a better um, um, route to guidance. Um, so we're still working that. So we need to do better in these policies that, that cover that. We also need to define the standards that we, that we expect to be met. Now, of course, our ambition would always be that this should meet uh, either the point of care standards, that's 22870, or when, when it is, is refined, uh, the uh, ISO standard 15189. Now, this is, I know, and, uh, and I'm, I'm sure some of you who work in the environment will be saying to me, hey, David, this is a lot harder than you imagine. I know how difficult it is for services to reach this level of accreditation when they're being, when you're talking about community services, when you're talking about services that um, are offered across organisations. But we need to find, working with UCAS, to find the routes to do that. Uh, in, if not in actuality delivering to ISO standards, but deliver up to a point where, as the guidance improves, as the services mature, that they can achieve ISO 15811. And that should definitely be in our mission, that the, the, uh, the core parts and the, and the principles and the, and the intention behind ISO is picked up in our services and in delivery of point of care. And we also need to understand the demands and needs of the workforce. It needs to be set out who should be doing what, how they should be doing that, uh, what's reasonable for them to be doing, etc. It should also go even further, in my humble opinion, it should start to, to define what are the use cases um, and from there, what are the requirements and expectations of the technology. Again, we saw this in the pandemic that different use cases different technology had different purposes. And, and, and I think that's how point of care should evolve. Um, I think uh, many of you will be, um, will be, who are involved in things like CDC will be, will be uh, having your questions say, well, can we have um, brain atrectic peptides or BNP uh, in our CDC? And the question quite reasonably is, is that the right place to have um, BNP testing for cardiac failure or should it be in primary care being delivered from the main laboratory? 
Uh, so is it the point of care device in the CDC to give rapid access to a cardiac failure pathway, or should it be being done in primary care before referral so that uh, the patient can be referred first time into the cardiac pathway? Now, I, I would argue that actually uh, the primary care is the answer for that, being delivered by a laboratory-based uh, test for sensitivity and specificity. Um, but still, that question needs to be answered, and, and, and what's the technology that, that that requires, and what's the sensitivity of that test that's required? Uh, to answer the question, should there be a candidate list of tests that, or, or a range of tests that could be used in point of care? Should we, and this is the global we, be starting to say what it is reasonable to be offered as point of care? So, for example, uh, is, troponin, is it reasonable to offer troponin in a, in a primary care setting? Question mark, Or is it reasonable to offer troponin in an ambulance, for example? Uh, both those may well have very different answers but they may well use the same technology in terms of delivery. So, and again, we need to make sure that we understand the use cases and understand what tests we're talking about. The level of IT connectivity becomes really important. So we want to make sure that all the data we gather, go back to my third slide, uh, we want all that data to be coalesced into the patient pathway and the patient information set. So whenever we do point of care, uh, why aren't we collecting the data? And you know, we all walk around with our mobile phones, oh, you can't see it, there. Um, you know, why can't that be used to, to, to send data, an image of the test result uh, or the pure data from a, from a Bluetooth connected device um, that get ended straight into the patient record so other clinicians can see it irrespective of where you are and your monitoring can be managed accordingly. Now the last thing should be of course is that any policy that comes out and, and I, I hinted at, at my frustration at the primary, the, the, the uh, pharmacy point of care guidance it needs to be in consensus and agreement with the NHS and all the professional bodies going forward. Uh, that thing for me is really, really important. Now, the good news is this is being done. So actually, uh, part of this conversation, and I'm hoping that there'll be some comments in the in the chat box uh, later on, but, but actually, if what I'm talking about now rings a bell, chimes with you, or, or in fact, if you think we can go further, or there are areas that I have not covered in this, in this talk about looking into our point of care, I'm working as part of my role as uh, working with NHS London in inviting the latest policy for point of care for NHS England. Now, I'm doing that in conjunction with in, in my, my day job as the Chief Secretary of the Institute, working with the ACB, working with Royal College of Pathologists, working with NHS England, etc., to make sure we pull a, pull a, a policy device uh, um, uh, item together that actually is reflective of all of our thoughts, ambitions, and wishes. Uh, in terms of reflection of point of care to make sure that we can deliver safe and, and effective um, point of care in our new world as we go forward. Like I said, it's not going to go away, so we need to make sure we're, we're on that page. And really what point of care can deliver to us is far better quality of access, uh, far more clinically or operationally appropriate testing that enables us to make best use of our NHS resources, uh, that we've got a service that is both accredited and high quality, so we, do ne we, we never throw away that quality. And it's got true integration into our quality at its core. So the patient results can be used from anywhere, uh, importantly, and that, that actually the clinicians can take that view of, of those results that have been made available and act upon them without having to wait for further testing, or they can uh, flag further testing as it's required. That's where we're up to. I hope, and to a degree, at this hopefully dovetails nicely in some of the work or some of the conversations that. that uh, 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 Deborah was discussing earlier on in terms of actually us having a great impact uh, on diagnostics and pathology in, in England, certainly. But I hope that we're continuing to see that progress as we move forward. And um, one last thing, which is a bit of a, a, a call for uh, people's thoughts and consideration. I've been talking about point of care. Now, does point of care genuinely describe what we do? Uh, or is it actually point of need testing? Does point of need testing describe better when we're talking about those four buckets of self-testing, home testing, clinical setting, and, and, and hospital setting? Because not all these settings are care settings. So actually saying point of care may well be inappropriate. And actually saying point of need might actually be a better way of describing this area of, of diagnostics. And hopefully, like if you've got any comments on that, um, I'm sure my email address will be made available, but it, it just, David Wells at ivymess.org. If you've got any thoughts, comments, etc., please do drop me a line. Uh, I'll stick it in the chat box in a second as we're, as we're wrapping up, and uh, I look forward to any other comments accordingly. So, thank you for your time, uh, and thank you, Sue, for inviting me to speak. Well, I have to say thank thank you ever so much, David, for agreeing at what was actually relatively short notice. 
and producing such a slick presentation, uh, which has taken, I, I think, consideration of point of care testing to several other levels very much indeed. And I can also see that there could be a whole load of um, uh, exam questions actually in some of the points that you raised there or discussion papers. So um, most interesting and thought provoking. Uh, I certainly resonate with the quality issues because I was one of the UCAS assessors carrying out assessment of the independent COVID testing providers visiting high street pharmacists and things like that. A fascinating range of variety of quality and ability. So this has been and really met on with Deborah's talk as well. Um, you know, the whole idea of taking pathology out of the laboratory and much wider uh, is great. So does any, I will just look at the chat box, which is David's uh, email address. Uh, Deborah's email address is there. David's email address is there. Lots and lots of thank yous from everybody. Um, hopefully people may go away from this and reflect and write up something from what they've learned for today and discuss it with people at work. We've had over 70 people on this call, which has been tremendous. So thank you actually to all the audience as well. So it's, it's a big thank you to everybody. And thank you to the Institute for setting up the technology so that all of this could actually take place. So I will leave the thank yous flooding in. Um, and at this point, so I say good evening to everybody um, and we will be setting up something else up in a few months time. Um, looking forward to seeing you all again. Thank you and have a lovely evening. Bye for now. Thank you, Sue. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Ron.